Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. It's a new year and a new chance to try out something different. So naturally, today we're looking at something associated with something I've already reviewed. I make so much sense. So 362 episodes and six years ago, I reviewed the first issue of NFL Super Pro, a widely mocked comic mostly for how stupid its idea is, a football-playing superhero tie-in with the NFL. It has been derided by many as being one of the worst comics ever made. <laughs> oh, you sweet, innocent children. Yeah, NFL Super Pro is barely a blip on the horrible comics radar. And even if you took away the deluge of terrible independent books out there, NFL Super Pro is really just a crappy cash-in comic that Fabian Nassiza only wrote to score some free tickets. Of course it wasn't going to be anything to write home about. Honestly, from what I can tell, the only thing of note about NFL Super Pro is that apparently Issue 6 caused some outrage from Hopi Indians because of the depiction of a villain as supposedly embracing traditional Hopi beliefs. And given my current rate of reviewing NFL Super Pro issues, I'm sure to reopen old wounds about that book sometime around 2045. Hell, Super Pro wasn't even Marvel's first foray into football-themed characters. The short-lived New Universe imprint of Marvel in the late 80s brought us Kickers Incorporated, a book that suffered creative problems by originally intending to be a very tongue-in-cheek adventure book that ran into problems due to the goal of the New Universe being grounded in realism. Fortunately, grounded in realism is not really something we need to worry about when it comes to NFL Super Pro. So why am I not looking at the second issue since we're coming back to the book? Well, that's because the first issue of the series was not actually the character's first appearance or origin issue. That came in the book NFL Super Pro, Special Edition Number 1. Ah yes, the special edition of something that premiered before the regular edition did. So let's dig into NFL Super Pro, Special Edition Number 1 and answer that question we all have. Are you ready for some football? <laughs> is rather meh, though it does feature painted artwork for our title character flying towards us from a football field that's floating in the vacuum of space. Well, I see that Dark City's football season has finally started. I mean, I suppose the fact that it is in space would explain why Super Pro is floating around like this, since I don't recall him being able to fly in the other comic. Representing the awesome origin issue! So clearly this comic is from the future, since otherwise it's difficult to represent something that's only now being presented. A new star is shining in the Marvel Universe. A star, a star, dancing in the night, and it's crossing the 30-yard line. This is 46 pages long, so naturally for a longer comic like that, they divided it into chapters. We open with chapter one, the lift that drops you. The first words of the comic, and they're an indication that something is broken. Good choice. Super Pro is standing in an alley in Newark, New Jersey, watching a group of goons carrying boxes into a building. The goons don't know what's in the boxes, so one is naturally concerned about it being something that'll blow up in his face. Gentlemen, I'd recommend you worry about something else blowing up in your face. Like my fist! Rocket-powered fists. No, but seriously, what does that even mean? Does he have grenades strapped to his fist? Why would it explode? Who does this guy think he is? Super football man? 
This is why you have embraced this profession. Close, Einstein, but you missed the first down marker by the length of a chain. Oh dear, he's gonna be doing that the whole damn comic, isn't he? He knocks down two, who inexplicably have different fonts for their grunts when they hit the ground. Weird. He wants to know where the boxes full of chemicals came from, but the police arrive before he can get an answer. Hey you, buddy! Little early for Halloween, isn't it? Oh, shut up. This is the Marvel Universe. It's gotta be a regular Saturday night thing for you. Although, ironically, this comic apparently came out in September of 1991, so technically it was a little early for Halloween. Super Pro makes a hasty exit while explaining that he's on the trail of an illegal steroid production ring. A bit odd, since steroids are already legally produced, and it seems like it'd be easier to steal them than manufacture them, but what the hell do I know? And, of course, he makes another football pun while he's at it. Because when you have one gimmick, you milk it like there's no tomorrow. I haven't been around the hero scene long enough to establish the kind of rep that gets guys like you to trust guys like me. Yeah, because it's your inexperience that prevents people from taking you seriously. That's it. Also, it really highlights the stupidity of his name. He's an amateur, not a pro. I mean, yeah, it's supposed to be a reference to him as a football professional, but other people don't know that. He arrives 40 minutes late for a date, and she's got to be really stuck on this guy, because I think after a half hour, I would have bailed. Or, at the very least, given him an earful of anger over it, but she's just like, Oh, this is so typical. Lol. In a civilian identity, Phil Grayfield, he's an investigative sports reporter, and we soon see him at Giant Stadium with his cameraman, Ken. Ah, the smell of sweat on AstroTurf. That's what my fetish is. The sound of beef slapping at each other through plastic and tape. It's what's for dinner. Phil tells Ken that Super Pro foiled a chemical smuggling ring. Funny how he seems to pop up in every city we're in. Think he feels the same way about us? Well, he's probably wondering why he's even trying to maintain the facade when his helmet has a transparent visor that doesn't hide his face very well. While Phil says hi to a football player friend of his, Ron Macadon, one of the rookies training seems a little too overeager during practice. Eat the carpet! Eat it! Wow! Is that ever not the slang you want to be using in this comic? And it's especially weird since it's one guy on top of another guy. Apparently Ron was the one who tipped him off about the steroids, but it seems it's all thanks to the guy who encourages the consumption of carpeting. And is also a pirate. YOUR! You scallywags, pass me the pigskin, or I be cutting you from me crew! The rookie is apparently a steroid junkie, and our heroes spot him later talking to a guy in the parking lot who hands him a box of the stuff. And just look at these two. The rookie is apparently a rejected Liefeld drawing that needs the steroids to keep up his massive physique without him. Deciding to follow the potential dealer, they pursue him to the state university, discovering that he's a teacher named Professor Morris. Using the most advanced computer technology that Commodore 64's had to offer, they see he's a tenured professor specializing in biological chemistry, and that he's got a consulting assignment with the Jacobs Pharmaceutical Company. Giving drugs to football players now? Is there really no limit to Martin Shkreli's douchebaggery? Here's my question. Why exactly is a pharmaceutical company interested in giving steroids to football rookies when they probably make billions in completely legitimate enterprises? Phil decides to investigate on his own, managing to sneak inside. Now what are those people doing down there this late at night? People working late? Clearly something nefarious is afoot. By the way, wrote this script at four in the morning. Anyway, after spotting that Morrison is among the scientists, he makes his way to a computer. Hmm, nothing listed here under illegal steroid compounds. What a surprise. Then why did you search for it? No evidence. No chance of nailing this down right here and right now. Oh my god, are you actually serious and we're hoping that's what it was under? That is both very sad and not the least bit shocking. However, he figures that even if he did have evidence, it wouldn't hold up in court since he broke in here. But then again, the information could still be useful to you. No need to be a downer here, man. He returns to Ken, who reveals that while Phil was gone, he used computer analysis to compare him and Super Pro, of course coming up with a perfect match. And thus he wants to hear the full story, leading us into Chapter 2, 
field of dreams and nightmares. Ooh, Kevin Costner versus Freddy Krueger. I like where this is going. Phil explains that he pretty much has the absolute worst luck of any football player in history. Basically, any time he started playing in a professional capacity, he injured his leg to some degree. First day, it was torn cartilage, then a broken femur, and finally pretty much destroying his knee while saving Ron McAdun's son from a fall. Ron felt bad about the whole thing, so arranged a way to give him some national attention, as well as kind of giving him a job as a sports reporter. Maybe it's time you put that double major of yours in journalism and criminal justice to use sooner than you thought. Oh, yeah, I totally buy that he double majored and was so prolific a college football player that he was the number one draft pick to the point where he was given multiple opportunities despite years recovering from various injuries. Like any of those things are hard. Once I was able to walk freely, my first assignment was to do a report on graft in the sports memorabilia trade. Ended up shattering both my knees that time. Basically, my legs are held together with duct tape and hope. Phil managed to land an interview with Rudy Custer, a very seclusive collector who got burned by some counterfeit material. After showing off his collection, Rudy decides to show him his most prized possession, in honor of Phil's incredible ability to screw up his legs at every opportunity. And that possession is... The Ultimate Football Uniform! <laughs> Yes, the ultimate in garish fashion. And for some reason, endorsed by the NFL. Or maybe Rudy just slapped that on there to pretend it was. Rudy explains that by trade, he's an inventor. This was my greatest triumph. And my biggest failure. Well, it was a failure, I'll give you that. The super pro uniform. The football uniform of the future. I invented it in the 70s, made out of fiberglass and plastic alloys. Would have been the best, safest, and most durable uniform ever made. Bullets bounce off the sucker for crying out loud. Yes, fiberglass and plastic. More powerful than steel. It didn't work out since the material needed to be individually molded to each player and the plastic compounds for the prototype alone cost millions. Before they can dwell on this any further, the doors to the room get busted down, although I'm not exactly sure how they broke them down given how they look in this panel. Look at these guys. They're brandishing assault rifles and huge guns, and what are they here for? To steal Rudy's sports memorabilia to sell. Yeah, we're gonna break into this place in broad daylight with no disguises while heavily armed to steal some sports stuff that will very quickly be reported as stolen and someone will probably be murdered over it instead of just sneaking in at night or something. We're great criminals! Just to highlight how SMRT these crooks are, they find some old film reel of games and use it to tie Phil up. They ain't worth much, but they make for good rope. Yes, decaying old film reel. The only substance stronger than fiberglass and plastic. They also kidnap Rudy. What, do they plan on selling him too? And I guess they take the memorabilia off screen, since the next panel is them setting fire to the place to kill Phil so he can't report them on the news or anything. Not that they really needed to. The film reel squeezed his legs a little and they collapsed in on themselves. So in the same room as the Super Pro outfit, Rudy just happened to store a crap ton of chemicals. And in all the fire and thrashing around, the chemicals spill onto Phil. The fire sprinklers kick in and wash the chemicals off. Quickly endowed with superpowers, because comic books, Phil grabbed the Super Pro outfit and pursued the crooks, kicking their asses before turning them over to the police. And I guess despite these guys seeing the suit earlier right next to Phil, they were incapable of putting two and two together. But yeah, Rudy let him keep the suit, and he's been fighting crime ever since. Ken says he'll help Phil to take out the steroids ring, leading us into Chapter 3. Better dying through chemistry. Your Mylar won't protect you now. Ken shows photos of the rookie, Carl Bennings, and all the visual evidence that he does steroids. What's more, he's uncovered direct links between Carl and Morrison, so they've got a lot of evidence on their side. But according to the photos you've hacked into, how does one hack into a photo? Ken says that this kind of thing happens. There's too much competition and pressure on young people to succeed, and thus they'll do anything to keep up with the competition, including drugs. And a sports organization like the NFL would never allow anything as serious as drug use happen in their ranks. 
Now, other criminal offenses, sure, but they have standards, damn it! Phil decides the best way to deal with Morrison is to barge into his office with a camera and ask him about the steroids. And here's the weirdest part. It works! Morrison caves almost immediately. He's more fragile than Phil's legs. Just asking him twice and then, okay, I'll talk. Just wow. He explains that he knew what they were doing was wrong, but there was pressure from both the students and the schools to produce successful sports programs. Jacob's Pharmaceutical went along with it because it would have brought them millions in black market profits. In the wake of the PR disaster caused by this, Jacob's Pharmaceutical rebranded themselves as the Umbrella Corporation. Actually, fiction really doesn't get this. While I don't doubt that there are shady business deals like this in real life, it's usually really not all that necessary. These kinds of companies have this tendency to do horrible and scummy activities that are perfectly legal. Anyway, Morrison says that this latest drug is an experimental one that Carl likely has taken already. We cut over to Carl and his matching friends as he decided to take the drug, and immediately Carl starts foaming at the mouth and mutating into a grotesque, over-muscled monster. Okay, Morrison, I'm making a note here in the lab report. Needs work. Ken and Super Pro arrive to confront Carl. You rookies are all the same, and you all need to be taken down a notch or two. This is like the third time this week one of you rookies transformed into a monster. It's starting to get repetitive now. So they fight some more, Carl mutating further and getting bigger and more mindless. Oh yeah, I can see how the black market will take a look at this face and the money will just roll on in. Eventually, Carl has a heart attack and collapses, meaning our hero didn't actually stop him. Whoops. Super Pro tries to give him CPR and he spots the other two players. Knowing they're involved, I guess? What the hell is this quiet look? Anyway, a few hours later, the players get word. Carl is dead. Yeah, they had to go with the super serious ending to the super serious and grounded comic about a superhero football player. Carl's friends flush their own steroids down the toilet. There's your lesson, kids. Don't do steroids. If you do, you'll transform into a hideous pile of tumors and drool. A week later, Phil is watching the news with his girlfriend. Morrison is arrested after his confession, but Jacob's Pharmaceuticals denies any involvement. And so our comic ends with his girlfriend asking just how he managed to get the inside scoop on all these stories. And Phil literally winking at the audience. Ha 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 ha! What a silly fourth wall breaking moment in this silly story about drug abuse causing someone to die. Anyway, this comic sucks. It's hardly the worst comic ever, but it's pretty goofy, and it takes itself way too seriously. US 1 at least is self-aware in how ridiculous it and its premise are, but this? It's played completely straight without a hint of irony or real winking at the camera. The origin itself is rather contrived, especially in random criminals just happening to break in and spilling conveniently placed chemicals on our hero. The football puns are terrible, and did we really need the drug PSA? Otherwise, it's passable in terms of how it's put together, but it's not good at all. It is, however, a good start for this year of the show. Come back next time when a Patreon-sponsored review shows us the real method for building muscle mass, spinach.
like to teach the world to get ready for some football. <laughs> <laughs>